Hey guys, what's up? Public here back to another video, and today is your Season 4 Shadow Priest preview video. So, this is going to be coming out a few weeks, hopefully, if I get this editing in time, before Season 4 is actually launching. And this is kind of the, the preview of what we should expect to see with the spec. Now, obviously, there's probably going to be some tuning and, and changes to things coming forward. Um, so, this is very much like early information, but I know a lot of people have been asking kind of what to expect for Shadow in this season. So, this video is kind of the precursor to that. Um, after the patch launches, I'm hoping to do kind of a, a review of this and do something a bit more in-depth like I've done in previous seasons. But at least for now, this will be a pretty good idea of what to expect day one of the patch. So let's dive in. Okay, so first of all, let's cover some gearing choices. So if you didn't know, we have a new tier set coming in Season 4, which is actually just a revised version of our Season 2 tier set, which is our 2 set. Increases the chance for Shadowy Insight to trigger by 25%. And then when you consume Shadowy Insight, Mind Blast deals 40% increased damage and generates more insanity. And then our four set is just simply Devouring Plague, damage increased by 18%. And then every four cast of Devouring Plague, you increase the damage of Shadowy Apparitions Conjured within the next 10 seconds by 100%. So this set bonus is very much Mind Blast, Devouring Plague, and Shadowy Apparition focused, which you'll see reflected in our talent builds. So a lot of folks won't actually transition to using this until you get the full four set, or if the item level difference is pretty crazy, um, the season three set will continue to be used until you actually see more tier. Um, and until you get the new tier set, you really don't change talents at all from what you're currently running today. Um, so the talents I'm about to cover are, are purely talking about when you have the new four set. Um, until you get that, you should keep using the old builds. Um, and that goes for basically until you get the new four set, because once you drop the season three, two set, that's when talent builds will start to change. So let's go ahead and dive into talent builds with this tier set. Okay, so let's talk about talent builds. I have my character loaded up on the PCR with kind of all the kind of preset builds that you're going to need for this patch, which I'll share in this video. Um, all the talent import strings will be linked in a GitHub gist in the description if you want to get them. And as things get updated in the kind of PCR cycle, that gist will be updated. Um, once the patch actually comes out, though, that will be transitioned into just being the Icy Veins guide for the spec. So for now, this is what we're looking at for single target. We are back to Dark Ascension being the go-to single target talent. It's like 3,500 DPS ahead of Void Eruption um, with, you know, comparable gear sets for each. And still likely something you're going to see for pure single target. And for most raid encounters, you're going to be playing Dark Ascension if you want to be optimal. Um, obviously, like 3,500 DPS to some people isn't that big of a deal. Um, I will show the kind of Void Eruption single target build in a second. Um, just kind of some notable changes here. Uh, like I already mentioned in my tier set video, if you didn't watch that, we're seeing a lot of power in Void Touched um, and Mind Devourer and kind of all of these but, uh, talents in this middle section are just very strong. And because of that, we're actually only running um, one, we're running one less point in this section. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine points in the bottom section and, and basically everywhere past, we've always run 10. Um, so in this case, we've actually dropped an idol and we're only running Idol of Cthulhu with this build. Again, just because of the power of the talents in this middle section. Even with Mind Spike, we're still taking Void Touch, which is, you know, not the most efficient pathing-wise. But these talents are so good. That's just kind of how things worked out. As far as playstyle goes, this is going to feel a lot more simple to what you're playing now on live. Because you're really not pressing Shadow or Death that often. Unless the target is below 20% health. Or you have a Death Speaker proc. And even this isn't like super high priority to use. Um, but this is just kind of how the build looks. You're going to be pressing quite a lot of Mind Spike in here. And you're just kind of playing the spec normally. There's not a whole lot of procs compared to what we're seeing in terms of like Mind Bender play styles. Although you do still have to juggle Mind Devour and Shadow Inside stuff. But, you know, no Inescapable Torment. That is, that is all gone. So now if you do want to play Void Form on single target, it does look similar. Although basically what we're doing is we're dropping Mind Spike to finish off Dark Evangelism. And then we pick up Yog saron instead of that kind of extra point inside of Scream. So it's a little bit different. No Death Speaker here. This is also quite simple. It's going to feel even simpler to play with um, because you just have one less proc to manage. No more Death Speaker. You're only hitting Death when it's below 20% health. And you're basically playing like normal. This is a Yog cthulhu build, very similar to kind of what we were running at like the start of Season 2. Um, although you are not running Mind Spike with this. Mindfly just makes way more sense with Void Eruption. And like I said, this is about a couple thousand DPS behind Dark Ascension and pure, pure single target. Although, depending on the case with the fight, maybe you like that extra movement with Void Eruption and Void Bolt. 
Um, it's going to be a little harder to fit in movement now that we don't have as many instant cast shadow or deaths throughout our rotation. Although you do have a bit more shadowy inside procs, so there is that. Okay, so transitioning to our kind of composite raid build, or specifically the one with Shadow Crash in it, this is probably what you're going to run for like 60% of fights. Basically, any fights with adds, you transition from the standard Dark Ascension single target build to this one. Um, Void Eruption has a, it definitely struggles more picking up Shadow Crash, although it is possible. You usually take out points from Dark Evangelism or Mind Devourer to pick up Shadow Crash and Whispering Shadows. Um, in this build, we ended up dropping the one point in Dark Evangelism and Void Touched to pick up Shadow Crash. And this is purely just because if there are any adds, you get a lot of value just hitting them once. You just pop the Shadow Crash in, and then you're good to go. So this is going to be your kind of standard raid build for a lot of fights, because just about every other fight has something with adds. But whenever you're fighting like a Volcaros or a Terrace, something like Terros, something like that, you'll go pure single target and drop the Shadow Crash. It's not doing you anything in single target. Okay, that kind of covers it for raid builds, except for council situations. Now, this is kind of an interesting transition because as soon as you hit multi-target, Void Eruption becomes king, specifically on sustained multi-target. Um, generally speaking, it's going to be enough to offset the loss in single target with these builds. But like I said, Void Eruption picking up Shadow Crash is a bit more of a loss than it is with Dark Ascension, so the gap is a little different there. But on any council builds, this is probably what I would start with. This is what we call like a traditional triple idol build, where you run Idol of Nazoth, yogg Saron, and Cthune. Notably, you do drop Insidious Ire, so some of that minigame gameplay of kind of making sure you're very efficient with our mastery is not in this build. You just uh, you can't fit it in. It's uh, not possible um, to get all three of these idols and Insidious Ire, unfortunately. So um, what this means is, again, you're kind of playing very similar. You're still spreading Devouring Plague with Destroyed Reality because it is a council fight. Um, you, it should be quite easy because it's a sustained AoE, especially if they're stacked up. Void Bolt makes refreshing that really easy, and you kind of tab around and move Devouring Plague across, which is just big for a Phantasmal Pathogen and our four set tier damage. This is our max AoE potential build. Um, which is also a good transition because this is also your max AoE potential build for Mythic Plus. If you can make it work with spreading devouring plagues around with Phantasmal Pathogen damage, this build is super versatile, especially with Mind Devourer procs. Now, this is not going to fit for every type of key. Um, particularly, what this is going to struggle with is low key environments. You still have to have some ramping time with Void Form. So, doing this in kind of lower keys, whatever that's like for your level, is still going to be a struggle. Um, and the other thing is super high-end keys really valuable the priority target damage you get when you play the kind of funnel devouring plague style of mind's eye so that's also a change you might want to you know sacrifice the overall damage to get the increase in priority target damage which just might be a better damage pattern for your group in mythic plus so we go to the mind's eye variant of this build you can see it's the same you literally just change <laughs> distorted reality to mind's eye and everything else stays the same now um, a lot of people aren't the biggest fan of Mind Devourer. They say it doesn't proc too much, which is certainly true. It is very, it's, you know, RNG. So this has some swing in it in terms of its overall damage contribution. So you do have a couple, you have an option here. If you don't like that proc play style, particularly with Mind's Eye, um, Mind Devourer is just so strong with this for reality. But if you're in a Mind's Eye situation, and you're like, yep, I'm going to sacrifice that overall damage, which is like, Give or take about 10% when you spread Devouring Plague to go to Mind's Eye, which you just funnel the priority target damage. But you're gaining like upwards of 20% priority target damage, so that might be worth it for you. Now, Mind Devourer in, you know, pure single target just claps the other choices of Dark Evangelism or Maddening Touch. Um, just a quick off the top sims real quick. Mind Devourer is a percent and a half above Dark Evangelism and over 2% ahead of Maddening Touch in pure single target. Now, where it becomes close or even slightly leaning towards Maddening Touch, when you get into stacked AoE with a bunch of mobs, moving the points out of Mind Devourer into Maddening Touch is a small increase. And when I say small, it's 0.2% at, at 8 targets um, for like a burst scenario. So it's not a whole lot. Um, but what might be helpful for some folks as we're starting out in the season is starting with Maddening Touch to get the extra insanity generation. And then as you acquire more gear, transitioning over to Mind Devourer because you don't feel as uh, insanity starved with the build. Um, 
So yeah, I think for overall, Mind Devourer is the safe default, although maybe experiment with Maddening Touch if you really feel like you need the extra insanity generation, or you want something that's a bit more consistent of a playstyle. Um, Sims often show you like the average damage of a build, um, but if you're looking at like the minimum damage of a build, meaning what if you got super unlucky with procs, um, Maddening Touch is usually more consistent of a pick compared to Mind Devourer. So depending on what you're looking for, that might be something that you're interested in. Okay, and then as far as builds go, that pretty much wraps up what you're going to play, except for low keys. So again, this is the kind of caveat where I said no Mindbender, no Inescapable Torment. Um, if you're in lower key environments, you might want to consider running the Dark Ascension AoE build, which is very similar to what the kind of Raid Shadow Crash is. You just pick up Bender, Inescapable Torment, and Nizoth. Um, this will play very similarly to how Dark Ascension builds play on live. You just remove the, the high priority Shadow Word Death. Um, with this build, you're basically only pressing Death while Bender is active or they're below the Execute threshold. Otherwise, you're really not pressing it like on cooldown like you do today on live because you don't have the, the tier set stacks that you need to be accumulating. Otherwise, it should play pretty similarly to what you're, what you're used to. So again, this is the kind of low key build. When you get into a spot where like packs actually start to live for like a full minute with full cooldowns, or you're pulling really big, um, that's when you can transition to Voider Option. But you know the low key stuff. Like if you're doing one pack at a time, this is the build that you play. That's kind of how it works out. Okay, that is as quick as I could possibly go over talents. Let's move on to everything else. <laughs> All right, so for us of the preview video, I'm just kind of kind of rapid fire uh, show off a bunch of kind of stats or things to look at. Um, from builds, um, I'm not going to go as in depth as it with talents because I know people care a lot about talents. But if you want the other stuff, again, most is going to be linked in the GitHub just in the description below. So if you want to kind of follow along with it there, that'll be kind of the place. And again, I will keep that updated as the PTR goes on, and then once it launches, that info will all get transitioned into the icy veins guide, which I've already started writing. Okay, let's start off with consumables. So as far as flask concerns. Um, Ice Fly of Corrupting Rage is still going to be the go-to for damage. The threshold is still around 70%. Um, if you have less than 70% uptime, that's when Tepid Verse is strictly better from even offensive perspective. But again, it's quite close. I think for any push content, Tepid Verse just makes sense because you get up to 70% of the value of Corrupting Rage and you get the defensive value. So it's a very strong flask overall. As far as potion goes, that's not changing. You still have Elemental Potion of Ultimate Power. And food buff. Um, it was already true that secondary stat food was just better than feast. That still remains to be true in this season. It even got a little bit better. Um, so if you're not already using secondary stat food, um, you should definitely do that. Depending on what you want, um, you can use basically any of them will be better than feast. Um, about 0.25% better. It's small, but that's how it goes. Okay, so enchants. Um, Head Enchant is still the same. You still have the Incandescent Essence from a Mirror Destroy that you can still use. It does scale with item level, remember. So as you're gearing up this season in particular, you definitely want to value getting item level on your Helm. It will be better than maybe item level on like Pants or even Chest, right? Um, because of that reason. So definitely something to look forward to. Um, our Tier Helm was pretty great as well. So try to get your hands on a, a, a highest item level Helm you can as fast as you can. For your Weapon Enchant, Wafting Devotion... Full stop. You are using Wafting Devotion all the time now. There was a choice with Suffolk Devotion, but in certain cases in this patch, Wafting Devotion is almost twice as good as Suffolk Devotion. That's how strong it is. So if you haven't already been using Wafting Devotion, it's time to swap to it. Uh, and part of that reason is we're seeing the value of haste skyrocket dramatically. Haste is one of the ways that we can really scale out our tier set and get more Devouring Plagues out, get more Apparitions out than we would otherwise. Crit can do some of that with Apparitions, but Haste has the double benefit of affecting so much else of our kit um, that I'm seeing in, in some multi-target builds, especially running over 40% Haste as being normal. Um, so because of that, Wafting looks really strong. Your Weapon Rune, your Rings, using Haste is probably going to be a good default for most people. Um, just something to keep in mind with a lot of stuff, even with gems as well. You want to be a little careful because these kind of small things can still get DR'd. So because they're getting DR'd, it might still make sense to swap them to Mastery or Crit. Um, but again, it's kind of going to depend on your character and what you're looking for. But I would not be surprised to see more people go into full haste for a lot of their stuff in this patch. Your chest and chance not changing. It's still waking stats. Um, for legs, we are probably going to swap to the Lambent Armor Kit. 
Um, we were using the one that gave us main stat and stamina. The stamina is like 1800 health or something like that. Um, the lamp and armor kit gives primary stat and versatility. Um, just with the way things have scaled, I'm seeing all of the sims now for a wide variety of builds and situations now lean towards Lambent Armor Kit, although it is quite close. If you do prefer the stamina, you can run that, but I personally think the versatility would be more valuable in this patch. Um, like I already mentioned for gems, um, similar to Ring Enchants and that kind of thing, kind of play around with the DR a little bit, um, but using Haste Mastery Gems, Haste Crit, Haste First Gems are probably going to be the go-to for most people. Okay, so let's talk about stats now that I kind of previewed some of that stuff. Um, so our stat priority is generally not going to change. We still want haste, then mastery, then crit, then verse. Um, you know that haste and mastery are kind of more even in season three. There is more of a lean now towards haste instead of mastery. Um, from like a gearing strategy or goal perspective, I am updating the IC veins guide with a lot more in-depth detail. But like the TLDR is still the same. You want to hit that first DR of haste and mastery, like 30% haste, 19% mastery. And then you want to get a solid foundation of critical strike about like give or take like 3000 to 4000. Um, and then you kind of want to dump everything else into haste or verse. And that's kind of where things end up with like top end gearing, getting upwards of like 40% haste. Um, Dark Ascension builds can fit in a bit more verse because they don't need to crank the haste up as much. Um, but Void Eruption builds love the haste. That's where the 40% really hits deep. Um, for raiding, you'll probably only see like 35% haste as a cap for Dark Ascension builds and pure single target. Um, Void Eruption is really where starts stuff starts cranking up to like 40%. So. Um, and as far as versatility goes, again, kind of another caveat here. It's still a great stop for defensive throughput. On a Void Eruption scenario in Mythic Plus, going from 2,000 versatility to 4,000 versatility and moving stats around everywhere else is a less than 1% damage loss to double your versatility from 2,000 to 4,000. So adding verse is still a really good option if you're getting to a place where you're pushing high-end content and you're, you're struggling to live things. Adding verse is still a great option. So keep that in mind. Okay, so now we covered stats. So let's kind of go a bit more into gearing. All right, so I'm not going to go over the full kind of best in slot lists or whatever for this patch. Those will be on the IC Veins guide if you're interested, but obviously gearing is a journey. Everyone's going to kind of follow a path slightly differently, so there are plenty of best in slot gear sets depending on what you get to drop when. Um, that being said, there are some kind of static things that I'll kind of mention for folks. Um, the first one we'll talk about is embellishments, so profession embellishments. So blue silk and lining is the god tier embellishment of season four. It's very possible that I say this, I put the video out, and it's going to get nerfed. Um, but as of recording this video, um, Blue Silk and Lining and running two of them is going to be your best bet for all forms of content as a Shadow Priest. Um, one Blue Silk and Lining is 1,000 Mastery. So running two Blue Silk and Lining is 2,000 Mastery. Um, that's insane. It's I think currently on live, I think it's like 630 or something like that. Um, so item level scaling on Blue Silk and Lining has really come through. This thing is going to be really strong. And I think we're going to run two blue silk and lining for everything. I will caveat this with in certain progression scenarios, obviously blue silk and lining uptime can be a problem. So you might want to run allied risk guards are still decent for raid progression. Um, but as far as everything else, blue silk and lining is basically clapping everything else across the board, starting at 50% uptime. Um, even if you want to compare it to elemental lariat, Blue Silk and Lining is equal to Elemental Lariat in Season 4 at 20% uptime of Blue Silk and Lining, which is, you know, the same as also not being the best in terms of, like, how nice it is to BSL with that. Even if you have Blue Silk and Lining for just the opener with Lust and you don't have it for the rest of the fight, it'll beat out literally everything else. So, BSL is very strong. Maybe Allied Risk Guards for Prague, but personally, I'll just take the flexibility of running BSL and kind of putting that on where I need it, whether it's wrist, cloak, belt, whatever it makes sense. And then uh, the other thing to keep in mind is cantrip items. So cantrip items really get, like kind of special effect things in the game. The very rare items from the last two bosses of each raid have higher item levels. We, as the Shadow Priest, we got the kind of short end of the stick. There's not a whole lot for us there. Um, the two big ones are the Voice of the Silent Star Cloak um, from Abaris, the last boss. This is still going to be a good option for us. Um, 
it, it is kind of like a raid. You're stealing stats from your friends, Cloak, so it's kind of a meme. But, you know, in top end, best in slot profile is technically there. Although you do take a stamina hit to run the cloak. So you take that with a grain of salt. Um, other thing is the the rings from Vault. So Vault has two rings that have cantrip effects. One from the first boss and one from the second to last boss. Um, we want to run both of the rings uh, straight up. Uh, the ring off of Aranog is a, is a fire damage proc ring. So when you do fire damage, you have a chance to proc the ring. And then you're probably like, okay, well, Shadow Priest doesn't do fire damage. How does that work? Well, um, you have a Helm Enchant. Our Helm Enchant of Incandescent Essence is fire damage. That is enough to proc the ring. It actually procs just enough to be to saturate the proc damage. The ring is going to be like a half percent of damage, and it's not our most ideal stats, but actually helped is fine in Season 4. Um, so the Aranog Ring, Seal of Diron is Chosen, is going to be good. Um, and then also we're going to be running Vakash, the one-handed mace um, from Fyrak. Because Iridol is out of the picture, right? Iridol is not going to be in Season 4, so our kind of cantrip weapons are either Vakash or Dreambinder. Vakash will clearly win as soon as you get an offhand that's worth its salt. Um, also, Dreambinder does weird things in Mythic Plus anyways with like mobs and rooting them, so kind of a weird choice anyways. Um, and Vakash also helps proc the Seal of Diana's Ring, um, which is great. The other ring off the second to last boss is Seal of Filial Duty. This is just a great defensive option, and it has great stats for us. And then again, we're able to proc this with the same things as well. So you're getting just a passive shield here too, or just a good defensive ring in general. So those are kind of the four kind of cantrip items to look out for as a shadow, and consider using your um, your tokens that you get to, you get to buy these depending on what drops you get. Um, so Vakash, Voice of the Silent Star. Seal of Diron is Chosen, and Seal of Filial Duty. Now that's just cantrip items. Let's move on to trinkets next, which do definitely play into the gearing situation. Okay, so talking about trinkets, uh, we have quite a lot of competitive options this season, depending on what you get to drop. Um, Whispering Incarnate Icon is making a return, and man, this thing is very strong. Um, I am expecting this to get nerfed or tweaked a little bit, but even if they do nerf it, the expected nerf that I would guess is still going to put this trinket at close to near best in slot. And it's a passive trinket. A lot of people are going to want to run it this season. You're going to get a lot of value out of it. So Whispering Current Icon, easily one of our top trinkets. Now, that's going to be the use case for everything. Like Whispering, it's literally a lock in all content. So now we're just talking about what your second trinket will be. That's how, that's how good this is. Um, so for your second trinket, in raiding, we have similar kind of choices to make that we made in Season 3. So Nymuse and Raveling Spindle is still really strong if the target is immobilized. The two good examples are like Volcaros um, and Naimu from Amir Dasil. Um, but Taros from Vault is another example as well. There's a couple in every in every raid where if a boss is immobilized, you're just getting that extra little bit of damage out of this trinket. It's still going to be really strong for those pure single target situations. Other than that, um, kind, of, kind of next up, if the target can't be immobilized, Belarus the Suncaller is still going to be really strong if you can afford to be in melee. Again, not realistic for every fight, but if you can, it's still a really strong single target trinket. Um, and then after that, the kind of other options you're going to run with are going to be Neltharians called a Suffering, um, which is just really strong because it is 535 item level. It is You do get the extra item level because it drops off of the second to last boss, and it's a very rare item. So Neltharians called a Suffering is a great passive trinket. So you could run double passive with Whispering and Neltharians and still get really good damage out. And plus the visual is top tier, so maybe it should, should be best. Um, outside of that, kind of an honorable mention there is Spoils of Neltharis is making a return. Um, a good good trinket from Dungeons as well. Uh, it's, a, it's an unused trinket we can easily pair with Power Infusion. So that's a good competitive option, as well as Ashes of the Ember Soul. So Spoils and Ashes are kind of the on-use trinkets you can consider. If you don't like Belarus, you don't get Neltharia's Call of Suffering. That's kind of relatively your like top trinkets for raiding. Now, if we transition this to look at multi-target, things are very similar. Although this is where Belarus just starts to lose value just because we're naturally just scaling harder off of secondary stats. So ironically, you know, as you add targets, Belarus starts to fall off a little bit. So in like a multi-target situation, it's just like a council boss kind of thing. Again, still whispering, lock in all the time, but then you're kind of then transitioning to using Neltharian's Call of Suffering or Spoils with Neltharis is a great option as kind of your kind of top two options with that. 
You can also use Ominous Chromatic Essence gets better. Again, secondary stats are just nice. Um, even if it's just you using it, Ominous Chromatic Essence can get pretty good value as well. There's also like things like Pips is also competitive. Um, and then Ashes of the Ember Soul as well for that multi-target stuff. If we transition to looking at more dungeon trinkets, so again, Whispering Incarnate Icon, still your go-to for dungeons. And then your second trinket, very similar again. Neltharian's Call to Suffering is going to be really nice. Ominous Chromatic Essence, still competitive. Pips is also strong. Could run Belroth just for that, like, to offset our damage on, like, a pack that has a bunch of little small mobs that you want to be competitive on. I think Belroth is still nice, although the stealth damage is not my favorite thing in the world. Um, as far as on-use trinkets go... If you can get you good use out of them, Spoils is still strong. Ashes is still good. Um, those would be the kind of two I would suggest for dungeons. So that's our kind of trinket situation. We don't have as many choices as we do currently on live. Way more inside of raiding. We'll see what the Whispering Incarnate icon ends up looking like. Like I said, I'm expecting it to get nerfed. It's just a question of by how much and what they exactly do to the nerf. But that's how trinkets are looking right now. Okay, last and very much least, uh, the last thing I wanted to cover is racials. This is something that gets asked every patch, although it's you know not the most impactful thing in the world, but people like to know. Um, if you're looking at which race to play as a Shadow Priest in Season 4, you basically have two things to consider. Are you trying to optimize for damage, or are you trying to optimize for utility? From a utility perspective, Dwarf is still going to be really, really strong in Season 4. Um, Night Elf, maybe. Um, to be honest, I don't know as many night values for Night Elf this in Season 4. It was really good in Season 3. Um, but Dwarf or Night Elf, from a utility perspective inside of Dungeons, is going to be your go-to choice. If you're looking for pure damage, um, Human is above and beyond the best race that you can pick. Um, this always happens towards the end of the tier, just the secondary stat scaling of Human just becomes really strong. So if you're just looking to do maximum damage, especially in Raid, Human is the way to go. Otherwise, Goblin, Gnome, Troll, all very good options as well. Okay, so that is my Season 4 preview video. It's very long, and if you stuck with me this long, you're great. Um, let me know what you like to see for videos coming up in the future. Again, hoping to kind of revisit a lot of the videos I made in Season 3 again in Season 4 just to help folks out. But if there is one that kind of stood out for you or something you thought I missed in last season that you'd like to see, please let me know. And big thanks to all the people that support me as a YouTube member or a Patreon member. I appreciate all the support, guys, and we'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.